Um, so for so for our first talk today, we have Christian Carrick from Utrecht, who will be talking about chromatic defect, Woods theorem, and higher real K theories. Okay, great. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to get right into it and talk about first the uh, second part of the title, which has to do with this Woods theorem. So let me let me start with reminding everyone what that says. So, so Woods theorem. So this this concerns everybody's favorite spectrum, little ko, and it says that if I take little ko and I tensor it with CP two or the double desuspension of CP two, then I get ku. So equivalently, maybe you've seen this written in this form. So the cone of, of eta is equivalent to the double D suspension of CP2. Okay, and this is a this is a really useful fact about KO. So pretty much any computation you would want to do with KO, like compute its homotopy groups or its homology groups or its MU homology groups, something like that. You can do it using this Woods theorem. Um, but I, I wanna point out today also some, some kind of qualitative aspects of Woods theorem. So let me, let me state some, some consequences of this. So one of the things that this tells you is that KO is in the thick tensor ideal generated by MU. So this follows from the thick subcategory theorem. And this is because the cone on eta is a type zero complex. And because KU is an MU module. Um, so some immediate nice consequences of this that you get, for example, are that KO satisfies the conditions of the telescope conjecture at all heights. Um, and similarly, you know that the adams novikov spectral sequence for KO has a horizontal vanishing line on a finite page. So these things that I've written are true for MU in place of KO, and then they're stable undertaking this big tensor ideal. Um, okay, so so I want to I want to talk about some some ways that you might generalize this Woods theorem, um, and the the pieces that that I want to uh, take a look at, which for for from my point of view are the most or the most relevant for this um, is the following. So if I look at this, this Woods theorem on the left-hand side, I have KO, which is not complex orientable. And on the right-hand side, I have KU, which is complex orientable. And then kind of the difference between them is this finite complex, which has a cell structure with just even cells, which tells you in particular that it's a type zero. Okay, and if I want to kind of mimic these three features, then I want to be a bit more flexible about what I mean by being complex orientable. So, so in particular, in this situation, I kind of get lucky that when I take this tensor product, I actually get a ring spectrum. But a priori, there's no there's no reason that this should be the case. So, in particular, the cone on eta is not a ring. Um, so I kind of want to be able to talk about complex orientations without referring to a ring spectrum. So for that, let me make the following definition. So let's take X spectrum. And let's let sigma K be the quotient map. of defining CPK. So in other words, sigma K is the kth attaching map for the cell structure on CP infinity. 
And I'm going to say that x is complex orientable if x tensor, this attaching map, is null homotopic for all k. So x is complex orientable if it, if it kills all of the attaching maps for CP infinity. And this, I don't need to require x to be a ring to state. But okay, so we should we should check, and I'm just going to say it's a nice exercise that this recovers the usual thing when x is a ring. So exercise if x is a homotopy ring spectrum. Um, then this is equivalent to well, since it's a ring, I have a unit map from the sphere, and I can ask this to extend over CP infinity. So it's equivalent to, to the existence of a of this dotted arrow in this diagram. So this is what I would say is the usual definition of being complex orientable because, well, this arrow here would be a Tom class for the universal bundle on CP infinity. Okay, so, so in order to make use of this other definition of complex orientable, this more general definition, um, we want to have some generalization of this theorem of Quillen, which says that, you know, for a homotopy ring spectrum, being complex orientable is the same thing as being an MU algebra. So to that end, we have the following nice fact, which is that X is complex orientable um, in, in the above sense, if and only if I could take X and apply the unit map to MU. And I can ask for there to be a retraction of that map. OK, so I'm not going to say much about the proof of this, because I want to focus on some, some nice consequences of this. But I will just say one thing, that this is this definition I've, I've written down here on the right-hand side. This is equivalent to um, MU, excuse me, to X being an MU injective. So in the sense of MU based atoms resolutions. So in other words, X is complex orientable, if and only if it's the sort of thing you can use to form MU based atoms resolutions. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make use of that later. Um, but for now, Let's use this to make a definition of kind of a generalization of this classical Woods theorem. So a definition, I'm gonna say a spectrum E is Wood type if there exists a finite BP free spectrum F such that E tensor F is complex orientable. Okay, so finite BP free, I just mean that the BP star homology of F is a free BP star module and that F is a, is a finite spectrum. Okay, so, um, so for instance, if F has a cell structure with just even cells, then it will be a, a finite BP free if it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so let me just give you an example of something like this, which is a bit more general than the, the classical Woods theorem. So this is this is a theorem of Meyer, Nauman, and Noel, which says if you take a finite subgroup of the Morava stabilizer group, height n, 
and I form the following homotopy fixed point spectrum. So I'm going to take Morava E theory and take the homotopy fixed points with respect to G. And they, they prove that this is wood type in the above sense. So a bit more specifically, they show that you can actually construct a finite BP free F so that when you smash it with EON, you get a sum of ENs. Okay, but in particular, it, you get something complex orientable. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about related concepts. So, so I mean, these, these, these wood types um, have a lot of nice properties like the ones I mentioned above for KO, but it's not so clear in general, how you how you're going to be able to find them, and so I want to I want to talk about a condition now a, a necessary condition for a spectrum to be a, a wood type spectrum, and so that's this that's this notion of chromatic defect. All right, so definition. I need to first define these X N spectra. So this is definition due to Ravenel. So he defines the XNs as it's a certain Tom spectrum on loops of SUN. So you take the map from loops SUN to loops SU, and then by bot periodicity, that's BU, and XN is the Tom spectrum of the composite. Okay, um, so what, what's useful about these, I mean, kind of the point of it is that if you take X1, you get the sphere spectrum. And there's a map between from Xn to Xn plus one. And the co-limit X infinity is MU. So this is some kind of very nice filtration of MU that interpolates between the sphere and MU. So for instance, these Xn's are E2 spectra, um, and you can say a lot about them using using the Tom isomorphism, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. But let me just say, um, as a kind of reminder, if you've if you've heard about this, that the the kind of claim to fame for these XNs is that they were used in the proof of the nilpotence theorem. So. In the Devonats Hopkins Smith proof, they essentially uh, inducted the statement of the of the nilpotence theorem um, downward along this XN filtration. Okay, so so now if if you want to actually work with these XNs in the same way with when when you're doing computations with MU it can be useful to replace it with BP. But well, there's there's a sort of version of that with the XNs as well, which I wanna, I wanna make use of. So let me see if this is a proposition. Is that the Quillen idempotent on MU localized at P, so the one defining BP, restricts to an idempotent on the P localization of Xn. And from this, you can define sort of BP versions of these Xn's called the, the Tn's. And T0 is going to be the P local sphere. And T infinity is going to be BP. So you have the same uh, picture, essentially, uh, but with BP instead of MU. Okay, so what I want to do with these is define this notion of chromatic defect. So we'll say a spectrum E has chromatic defect capital Phi of E
And I'm going to define this to be the minimum n such that E tensor xn is complex orientable. OK. And, and then I can use the Tn's instead and get a p-local version. So let's suppose now that E is p-local, then I can set this phi lower p to just be log p of E, which you can check is the same thing as if I made this same definition with Tn in place of Xn. OK, so that's kind of the, the p-local version. Um, so let me start out with a few examples of things we know about this chromatic defect. So, well, the, the first thing is that phi of E is one, if and only if E is complex orientable. And this is just because X one is the sphere. Um, so in some sense, this chromatic defect is some kind of measure of how far the spectrum E is from being com complex orientable with respect to this XN filtration. So some more interesting examples. The chromatic defect of KO is two. and the chromatic defect of TMF is four. And these examples are both due to Hopkins. Okay, so, so this, is, this is chromatic defect. And I, I claimed that I was gonna tell you about a, a necessary condition for a spectrum to be wood type. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna do now. So let's take this as a proposition. Um, if E is wood type, then the chromatic defect of E must be finite. Okay, so just a, a couple words about, about the proof of this fact. So kind of the, one of the important things about these TNs, which you can deduce for instance, from the Tom isomorphism, is that they agree with BP in a range. So, that, so the map from TN to BP, this is a degree of VN plus one minus two equivalents. So the, the homotopy groups agree through that range. And it follows from this that if F is a finite, BP free, then F is a TN free for some big enough N because F is finite. And so I can I have a bound on the degree of all of its attaching maps, for instance. Okay, so, so why does this prove the proposition? Well, if E tensor F complex orientable, so E is a wood type spectrum, and so is E tensor F tensor TN. And so, so is E tensor TN because this is a retract. Since F is a TN free. Okay, so that's that's the proof. So this having finite chromatic defect is is a uh, a necessary condition for E to be wood type. Um, so as a corollary, for instance, of this theorem of uh, Meyer, um, Nauman, and Newell, all of these EONG spectra. Um, have finite chromatic defect. Okay, so I'll come back to this example and, and actually 
tell you how to compute this explicitly in this case. But let me finish this section by stating a theorem of, of Robert Birkeland's, um, which concerns this chromatic defect stuff. So, so he, pro he proves that if the chromatic defect spectrum is finite, then E satisfies the telescope projection at, at all heights. So we already observed this for, for wood type spectra. So and he has a proof of the stronger claim that this is true also for spectra with finite chromatic defect. And my understanding of his proof is essentially that he looks at these XNs in the uh, TN local category, where by TN, I mean the telescope on a finite spectrum. Um, okay, but anyway, I guess here in this picture, we're working not TN locally. So it's a little bit of a different story. Um, but anyway, this is a nice, it's a nice result. Okay, so let me now move into um, some new examples. So new examples of, of the computation of this, of this chromatic defect number. So let me state kind of a non-example, I guess, so, um, which concerns finite spectra. So F is a finite spectrum. And the chromatic defect of F is always infinity. Okay, so I think for the sake of time, I'm not gonna give the proof of this, but this is a nice result that tells you somehow any finite spectrum is still finite, is still infinitely far from being complex orientable. Um, and the the key ingredient to the proof, I'll just say in words, is this theorem of John Beardsley which tells you that actually in this XN tower, um, each XN is, uh, is, has a universal property as an E1 XN minus one algebra. Okay, and this is a really nice fact about this XN tower, which you can use to prove things. And, and that's, that's what I use for this, but I'll just, I'll just leave it as, as this for now. Um, and let me, yeah, move on to another example now. So in general, the, the most useful way, the, mo the most useful way to, um, to try and approach this chromatic defect question is to make use of, of the Tom isomorphism. So explain that, let's let E be a complex, orientable ring spectrum. Um, and the Tom isomorphism computes the E homology of XN. And it's basically filtering the E homology of MU in this nice canonical way the E homology of MU is E star on these BI generators. And this map here is the, is the obvious inclusion. And similarly for the P local case, we have this inclusion. Okay, so for instance, if I take E to be mod P homology or say BP homology, what this is gonna give me is change of rings isomorphisms for spectral sequences like the atom spectral sequence of let's say X tensor Tn or the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence of this. So, and 
using these change of rings isomorphisms, in many cases, you can say things like that these spectral sequences must collapse if X has certain properties. And that's kind of, that's kind of the, the main thing that goes into a lot of these examples that I've worked out. So let me say how this goes in this EON case. So let's let G be a finite subgroup. Rob a stabilizer group. Situation as before. Um, and I'm going to let new be the evaluation on the endomorphism ring of the formal group law uh, corresponding to this GN. And I'm going to take the normalized one so that nu of p is equal to 1. OK, wow. then the, the theorem here is that the chromatic defect of u and g is um, the height n times the maximum of the value of this valuation, nu, um, on g minus the identity as g ranges through non-identity elements in this finite group g. So I guess the, the point is just that this chromatic defect is, is computable in terms of this uh, number theoretic information involving this valuation. So, so let me give just an example of this to show you how this is not such a mysterious thing. Um, so let's take N to be of the following form. And this will tell you that there's a CP to the K in the Morava stabilizer group at height N. And you can do some valuation tricks to compute. Um, phi, so sorry, I wanted this to be my p local phi in the theorem up here. The chromatic defect in this case, the CP to the K subgroup is gonna be this number, P to the K minus one times M. Okay, and like I said, that, that you reduce this to saying something about this valuation and it follows from that. Okay, um, let me let me move on to some other examples. So I, I've I've told you that this uh, chromatic defect condition or the condition of having finite chromatic defect is a, a necessary condition for a spectrum to be of wood type. And so I'm, I'm going to describe to you now some situations where that implication goes in the other direction. And this concerns um, FP spectra. So let me, let me start by giving the definition of an FP spectrum. And this is due to Mahowald and Resk. And well, there's a few different ways to state this, but let me at least state it this way. So let's say if E is a P complete bounded below spectrum, E is said to be an FP spectrum if there exists a finite spectrum as F, uh, a finite P local spectrum uh, with the property that when I tensor E with F, I get a finite sum 
of shifts of HFP. So E is an FP spectrum if, if this can be done. Um, and let me just give you a, a couple examples. So the main way you would come up with an example is, is by the following observation. E is an FP spectrum in the sense I just stated, if and only if its cohomology with FP coefficients is a finitely presented module over the Steenard algebra. So this is where this FP terminology comes from, um, plus E is P complete and bounded below. Okay, so for instance, you have some, some examples. So, so for example, we have truncated Brown-Peterson spectra, the BPNs. We have KO, TMF, the connective image of J spectrum, and more. And also, you know that um, this condition of being an FP spectrum is actually a thick condition. So if I take anything in the thick subcategory generated by one of these, I also get an FP spectrum. So, so there are quite a lot of these. Um, and I'm going to talk about this chromatic defect in this context a bit. So let's, let's now, for the rest of this section, let's let R be an FP spectrum, an FP ring spectrum. So I want R to be an FP spectrum and a homotopy ring spectrum. So that's all I mean by that. Um, then we have the following. So let me say a theorem about this. If the chromatic defect of R is finite and the atom spectral sequence of R tensor BP collapses on E2, so it has no differentials, then R is wood type. So this is, this is kind of a partial converse to what we talked about earlier. Um, namely, if R has finite chromatic defect and this other condition, then R is wood type. So I'll say, I'll say the following about the proof. The main ingredient is that there exist finite spectra F that are BP3 and with the property that the cohomology of F is free over Pn. So Pn, this is some subalgebra of P. P is the even part of the Steenrod algebra. And you can construct spectrum, you can construct finite spectra that have even cells only. That tells you that it's BP free, uh, that has this, this property that the cohomology is free over Pn. And essentially these are the these are the finite spectra that appear in the uh, analogous statement of Wood's theorem for R in this case. And you need to know that the atom spectral sequence of R tensor BP collapses to actually get the splitting, but essentially the, the spectrum that appears is gonna be one of these F. Okay, so let me give, let me give an example of when you actually have this condition. So let's let R be as above. Um, then I can write the, the homology of R in the following form. So AN is some finite subalgebra of the Steenard algebra. And since R is an FP spectrum, its homology can be written in this way. And if the x over 
E n star of this co-module M is concentrated in even degrees. And basically everything we have above will hold. So chromatic defect will be finite. The atom spectral sequence of R tensor BP will collapse. And so R will be wood type. Okay, so let me just say a, a bit about this EN star. So AN star is some finite pop algebra and EN star is a quotient of it, which is an exterior algebra. And so if you actually have the homology of R in hand, this is kind of a reasonable condition to, to check because you're doing X over an exterior algebra. All right, so for example, this condition about X over EN star being even, this is true for the following spectrum. So, so this happens quite a bit. Um, all right, so now I've told you a bit about what, uh, what sort of properties you get if you have um, if you if your spectrum is a wood type spectrum and some situations where you can you can actually deduce that now let me let me say a bit about what you can do with this uh, analog this uh, analogous version of, of wood's theorem so so you can you can use this to construct something that I'm going to call the Z, the Z index Adams Novikov spectral sequence and the the idea is is essentially um, to copy this idea of Mahowald and Resk that they developed for FP spectra. So let me let me explain how that goes a bit. So so if E is an FP spectrum, then by definition we said that there exists a finite spectrum F, so that when I tensor E and F, I get I get a sum of shifts of HFP. And so what they observed is that you could use this to construct a kind of non-standard Adams tower for E. So for the moment, let's just look at this part of the diagram. So here, what I've drawn is the standard Adams tower for the F-based Adams spectral sequence for E. But what you can observe is that all of these cofibers here are actually eilenberg maclean spectra. And these vertical maps are homology monomorphisms. And so that tells you actually that this is an Adams tower for E in the sense that the E2 page of the spectral sequence you get in particular uh, from this tower will be, will be the usual Adams spectral sequence of E. Okay, but now since F is finite, then I can, I can sort of flip this construction around and use it as dualizable to build this part of the tower. So, so what I'm doing here is I took, I took the inclusion of the bottom cell into F and I applied Spanier whitehead dual to it to get this map. And I can take the cofiber and repeat that. And what I notice is that I have the same kind of situation. I have that each of these fibers here is an eilenberg maclean spectrum, and that the vertical maps here are, are homology surjections. So in particular, if I take the cofiber, I'll have the cofibers down here with the same property that these pieces will be, will be eilenberg maclean and these will be homology monomorphisms. Okay. Um, so let me let me tell you what what they conclude from this. So so let me see if this is a theorem. The whole risk. So 
So the first thing is that um, if f is type n plus one, so f is a finite spectrum, and so I can ask for its chromatic type, if it's type n plus one, then the co-limit of this tower is the LNF localization of E. So that tells me that if I take the spectral sequence associated to this filtered spectrum here, I get something computing the homotopy groups of the finite localization of E. So even better, they showed that its E2 page was something that's, that's algebraically computable. So its E2 page looks like the classical Adams E2 page, but you, you do some sort of Tate cohomology. So it's, it's something like um, Tate cohomology for finitely presented co-modules over the Steenard out over the, the dual Steenard algebra. So in any case, it's something that you can compute the usual kind of derived functors recipe. Okay, so let me explain now how you could do a similar thing with the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. So I guess the main observation here is that um, this notion of being an FP spectrum, if I replace it with the notion of being a wood type, I can actually do all of the same things. So let's suppose E is wood type so that I have a finite BP free F so that this is complex orientable. Then I can build, I can build the same sort of tower. And what, what can we observe about it? Well, all of the cofibers in this tower here are uh, BP injectives. And that follows from this proposition I stated in the beginning about complex orientability. So these are all BP injectives. And then because F is a BP free, all these maps are BP homology monomorphisms. So immediately we get the same conclusion, which is that this part of the tower is a BP Adams tower for E. And that this part is giving us some kind of natural C graded extension of that. Um, okay, so then what are the corresponding theorems for this thing? So the first thing is that actually the co-limit of this tower here is zero. So in the previous case, we had uh, this LNF localization, which is nice. And, and maybe at first this seems like not such a great conclusion that you just get zero, but actually that's pretty useful um, because of the following sort of situation. So I can look at the, the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence of E. That's this here. So let's just look at this part of the diagram. And that's coming from this part of the tower, which is just a BP Adams tower of, for E in the usual sense. Now there's a map from that into the spectral sequence I get from taking this whole, this whole filtered spectrum. And just by construction, this map is, is, a, is an isomorphism in positive filtration and its rejection on the, on the x-axis. But this spectral sequence has to converge to zero. And so this situation here tells me that the differentials in the upper half plane have to coincide for these two, uh, for these two spectral sequences. But here there have to be differentials because everything has to get killed. So if you can understand this spectral sequence, then you can, you can deduce differentials in this. And there's a way of sort of relating this to the Tate cohomology picture I mentioned with Mahoald and Resk, which is, which is through the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence. So the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence is just what I get when I filter the Cobar complex iadically. I here is the is usual, the usual ideal in BP star generated by the, the VIs. And I get an analogous uh, Z-graded algebraic Novikov spectral sequence just by filtering the E1 page of this whole thing iatically. And the, the claim is that actually the, the E1 page for that is the same sort of Tate cohomology 
as described in the mahowald resk situation, but over P star. So in other words, you, you can actually hope to access this Z-graded adams Novikov spectral sequence um, via the algebraic Novikov. Okay, so is it okay if I do just like a couple more minutes? Sure. Okay, so let me just run through uh, the, the spectral sequence in an example. So I wanna take the example that we started with, which was KO and the classical Woods theorem. So if I look at this Z indexed Adams tower, Adams Novikov tower for, for KO, what I see is I just get the, I just get it like a sort of Z indexed Ada Blockstein tower for KO. So I can compute what's happening here fairly easily. So the one page of the Adams Novikov for KO, which I get from kind of this part, is just the homotopy groups of KO adjoin eta. And the E1 of the Z Adams Novikov will be uh, that with eta inverted. Okay, and so what you can check is that there's a D1 here, which sends V1 to two eta. And immediately you conclude the E2 pages. Look like this. Okay, and so now let's now that we have these two pages, let's look at the the spectral sequences. So here are my E two pages. This is the Adams Novikov for KO, and this is the Z indexed one. And so just to illustrate how you would use these, um, let's show that you have this differential. So how you can argue this is you you can say well if this differential doesn't happen then this spectral sequence here has to collapse. And, and as a consequence, this spectral sequence uh, downstairs will also have to collapse. So the differentials in the upper half plane are going to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. And so that's why that follows. But this spectral sequence downstairs can't collapse because it has to converge to zero. So I guess the basic idea is this kind of maneuver you make where you use naturality and compare with a spectral sequence that is converging to zero is a, a fairly common technique. And it, you would often see it when you're comparing the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence to the Tate spectral sequence. Um, and here, if you have a, a spectrum, one of these wood type spectra, you can actually, you can do this the same sort of thing in this way. Um, Okay, so I think I will stop there then.